Welcome to your Truth Reveal video podcast, sharing the power of self-knowledge. I'm Erica Marku. Episode three, Know Your Neurotransmitters, is the first part of an interview with Pam Magamel Helmley. This interview is about brain health and balancing your neurotransmitters, the chemical messengers between nerve cells to improve mood and sleep. All of season one helps you to be your own health expert as I interview industry professionals to explore your hidden mental and physical health potential. My guest today is Pam Machamel Helmley. She received her Bachelor of Science degree in scientific nutrition from Texas A&M University. She is the Chief Science Officer of Wellnessity and the CEO of Neurogistics Corporation. She began neurotransmitter testing to help clients deal with sleep disorders, anxiety, depression, and focus. She co-developed a way for people to take a clinical test kit at home. And these tests indicate critical areas of wellness, including brain health, digestive health, hormone health, and foundational health. This interview is to help people who want to reduce anxiety, elevate mood, and improve focus. Know that you can take an at-home test to show your neurotransmitter levels and make changes to improve your health. You know, you do not get fresh neurotransmitters from a synthetic medication. So they redistribute them, but they can't give you fresh. The only way to make your brain chemicals is through the proteins in your diet. Pam, I am so pleased that you're here today to share your knowledge with our audience. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Erica. By measuring actual biomarkers, you can determine what is out of balance and create customized nutritional and dietary solutions to bring levels back into normal ranges. It's really exciting for clients to be able to take their health in their own hands Mm -hmm. and do some things that we consider foundational because they're nutritional in basis. So cleaning up your diet, stress management, but measuring some biomarkers that you might not get in a basic health and wellness check at your clinician. So you're able to look at these levels and do something about them to take action on them. And we love anything that is complementary to something you might be doing if you have to take medications for your thyroid for example we want to make sure that nothing is contraindicated for that but you're doing the things that will truly make a difference in your well-being that's excellent i was one of those customers i had no idea i could take an at-home test to actually look at the neurotransmitters and what was helpful for me was to be able to see the facts behind Mm -hmm. how I was feeling so I had a, a lot of trouble sleeping it's nice to put numbers to the feelings right yeah or to quantify something and you know a urine test because it is excretory it's leaving the body it's not perfect but the ratios are what's really indicative of what's going on with you and so we love working with children and adults that are having issues so it's fun to quantify it and go wow if i eat more of this and i do this type of exercise because my body is really stressed and take these natural supplements to make more of those neurotransmitters it can literally change your life as it did mine Oh, can you share more about your own story? I can. I spent some time uh, as a young child in Europe. And when I was over there, I was much healthier than I was in the United States. We took fish oil. We did tryptophan. We walked everywhere. We had a refrigerator, of course, the size of a one that we had in college. And we had fresh foods every day. And in school, well, we walked to the beach for lunch. Wow. So it was such a conducive atmosphere. And I wasn't sick over there because everything wasn't dairy-based. We didn't have the gluten problem. When I came back to the United States, I got pretty sick. How old were you when you were in Europe? Probably kindergarten, first grade. 
I had been told all along, you have hyperactivity. You sit in this chair, we're going to set a timer and you're not going to move for that amount of time. And I would be doing headstands, you know, on the chair. My rocked in my chair for hours on end with and a blanket. And you rocked because you were diagnosed with uh, Well, I didn't get diagnosed with Asperger's so I was much older. Back then, they didn't have a term for it. How old were you when you got diagnosed? Um, probably in my 30s. Oh, goodness. So... Wow. I'm on the downhill slide to 60 now, a long time, but I spent 25 years trying to balance things. Well, I realized when I was in college that I needed to do something different. I wanted to be more normal because I wanted to be able to wear jeans like my college roommate. You right. know, I wanted to be able to eat foods that had had these different textures. You know, I'd have to look outside and say, oh, shorts. That means, oh, yeah, it is summer semester. I need to wear shorts and then I could bring it all back in. And why was that not clicking normally? I think that as I had more and more food choices on my own versus my mom who made healthy meals, I think it intensified. And also the stress of, you know, living by myself mm -hmm. for the first time in a college dorm and realizing how truly different I was. Mm -hmm. You know, in high school, I had a ton of friends. I was a bit of an adrenaline junkie, but they didn't know how odd I was that like I didn't sleep or that I had to roll myself up in a sheet plus a blanket to be able to sleep because there's a lot of sensory integration mm -hmm. issues that can come along with a child on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And of course, diet plays such a role because you've got to have a healthy gut to have a healthy brain. And when I got my genetics back, oh, probably three or four years ago, I thought I spent 25 years to figure all this out and I can just do this one <laughs> test. Now, it wouldn't have told me how to solve it, but it certainly helped because there's a lot of commonalities genetically to, to folks that are on the spectrum. That makes sense. And I had to change what I was doing dietarily. I had to support my brain because genetically my family doesn't make neurotransmitters the way that it should. Mm -hmm. Neither and does mine. Yeah. <laughs> Americans are kind of unique, you know, we're such a melting pot. Yeah. We're not a pure society as yeah. far as genetics. And so we're kind of tricky. We you know, are All tricky. of us are so different. Yes. <laughs> I agree. I see some commonalities, you know, when we look at genetics, of course, in other countries and Americans are, are, are quite the difference. But by that time I had children, I was incredibly dysfunctional, Aww. you know, between hormones and neurotransmitters are so closely related. And I, I know we'll talk about that in a yes, minute, yes. but um, really grateful to find a biochemist that said they'd been doing it in Germany for a long time, this testing. And he said, you should try this test on one of your patients. And I thought, I'm the craziest person I know. I'm taking this test myself. And so sleep was a big issue. No, no more than two and a half hours. And so it Goodness. really it really did change my life, wow. you know, getting my brain balanced and then working with all the people in the pharmacies that were coming in that were failing medication therapy. Mm -hmm. So it was a, Which is more common than I realized. It's amazing. You know, yeah. you do not get fresh neurotransmitters from a synthetic medication. Okay. So they redistribute them, but they can't give you fresh. The only way to make your brain chemicals is through the proteins in your diet. It's the only way. Wow. We have a lot of uh, folks that will come through that are vegan or vegetarian, and they're not getting enough rotation of proteins. Mm -hmm. So we have to talk about, let's make sure you're really rotating the nuts, the seeds, the beans, you know, to get all those different amino acids. You know, it's exciting to be able to affect those kinds of things through diet and supplementation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one of the movies that I've seen recently was Temple Grandin. Oh, love her. I just think she is amazing. I mean, she grew up autistic, barely mm -hmm. able to speak. Right. And has contributed so much. Oh, my goodness. In and terms her understanding. Of her understanding, her ability to articulate it. When I learned about her in graduate school, it helped me to understand myself. Sure. Absolutely. Because I thought, well, I'm not autistic, but I am extremely sensitive. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading the chapter on her and she said, well, yeah, put the weighted blanket on and you'll just feel relaxed. So I didn't have a weighted blanket, but right. I, I got onto my couch and I just put a bunch of pillows on top of me and mm -hmm. I went, oh, like that works. <laughs> it's so wonderful. I have a very heavy one. And my husband knows if he has anything else to say to me before the weighted blanket goes on, you better hurry up because Get it, it out. calms the whole nervous, nervous system. system. 
And we are that combination of genetics, but you also have to think about what was the in utero experience. Did mom have any fight or flight experiences? Um, I specialize in my own practice within my company in internationally adopted children. And now I do a lot of domestic adoptions. And what what's so interesting is, you know, these moms, many of them knew they were going to give up these babies. And so their brain was very excitatory during the pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And the child's brain then is developed thinking that that is the norm. Mm-hmm. And so they work very hard to keep that excitatory homeostasis. Yes. And so in order to calm that brain down, it takes a lot So there was a study done by Karen Purvis at Texas Christian University, Mm -hmm. and I had the benefit of getting to meet her. Some of the children that didn't qualify from the study, I was able to work with them, and we found that it took about three months or longer to really start calming that brain that had a heightened expectation, you Mm -hmm. know? So if the door slams, they responded for a really long time versus, you know, other folks. We adopted our daughter when she was seven. Wow. So she was in foster care. Mm -hmm. I've always been on the lookout for her having maybe an overactive nervous system. I'd love for you to talk about what neurotransmitters and hormones that you do test Mm -hmm. and why. Absolutely. We do a panel that's Mm -hmm. our most prolific one, the ones that that we have the most data on, and we test um, seven neurotransmitters. But we'll start with serotonin because I consider it kind of the mother of all neurotransmitters. And serotonin is so important because it plays a role with our mood, with our energy. Um, It can cause carbohydrate cravings if it's too low. It affects our sleep cycle. Through a number of pathways, our serotonin converts into melatonin for a good sleep cycle. I see. And so it's really important to have healthy levels. And in the U.S., we have very low serotonin levels because we eat so much gluten. So gluten decreases serotonin levels? It does. We make almost 95% of our serotonin in the GI tract. Mm -hmm. So we have 7,000 square feet of villi in the intestinal tract. So if we're putting this glue in there, which is what gluten is, it adheres to those villi and prevents the absorption of our serotonin. And a lot of people don't know that we have that much serotonin in our gut Mm -hmm. versus our brain. Right. We think that our brain chemicals are only made there, but they're not. not. Just like our hormones. Women say, well, I had my ovaries out, so I don't have any more estrogen. Yet we test their levels and they're still healthy because we make them in a lot of places that we don't even know. So it's pretty exciting. It's very interesting. But you know, serotonin is really important. If you think about children, goodness, almost all children's snacks are carbohydrates related unless we're Mm -hmm. really being diligent with fruits and nuts as they get older and things like that. Because there's a downhill flow in the synthesis when you're in conversion of neurotransmitters, serotonin has to be up there. What do you mean by a downhill flow? Explain that. So one neurotransmitter will convert into another, kind of like serotonin converts into melatonin. Now, we can make those neurotransmitters independently, but we really want to have a healthy downhill flow of all of those neurotransmitters. So serotonin will convert into dopamine. So that's the second neurotransmitter. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. So is it almost like a waterfall? The serotonin comes down and then it can convert into melatonin. And Mm -hmm. even dopamine. Right. And then norepinephrine, epinephrine. So there's a lot of neurotransmitters there. Now, it's not the only pathway, but it's an important pathway. Is it a primary pathway? I think that serotonin is one of the most important neurotransmitters to have in a good ratio. So think about everything in life for us is stimulating. The phone rings. You slam the door accidentally. That causes the brain to respond Mm -hmm. with an excitatory response. Mm -hmm. Oh, what was that? Or, oh, I need to slam on my brakes in the car. Someone stopped quickly in front of me. The only way to calm the brain from that 
stimulating response is with serotonin and GABA, our uh-huh. calming army that has to run into the synapse and go, wait a minute, you're not supposed to be here. And you think about those friends that you may have scared when you were a kid and they recuperated right away. But then there's the friend that was shaken for 20 minutes. So their calming neurotransmitters Mm -hmm. were subpar. Yes. And the same is true with folks that go into surgery or have a baby, Mm -hmm. balanced body and brain, whether it's hormones, you know, or your brain chemicals helps you endure whatever, you know, we Mm -hmm. we come across in life. Mm Dopamine is our joy neurotransmitter. Mm-hmm. And I have a lot of folks that come and tell me that I don't have any more joy. And I'll okay. ask about focus and memory and drive and motivation. And you'll usually find that there's some other concomitant things that go along with that. Okay. Dopamine is the focus neurotransmitter that we hear so much, you know, particularly when it comes to ADD or ADHD. And they use stimulants for that. It's much Mm -hmm. like other folks that use caffeine, same mechanism, push dopamine into the synapse so that we can focus better. However, sometimes dopamine receptors aren't very healthy Mm -hmm. or it's genetic. That, yes. you, that you'll see it in a family. You know, you can look at the family tree. We have lots of families where we have three generations that have gone through. Well, good for them. Yeah, for it's working really, on it. It's really great as a family. Just supporting dopamine can help. It not everyone is going to get their levels into a perfect range, mm-hmm. but dopamine is in, important. I realized that there was a problem with my dopamine. I was painting my house and I really wanted to do it. And, you know, I was really excited and we painted the house and I was like, oh, okay, that task is done. Instead of being, wow, I've been wanting to paint the house this color for so long, you know, and in feeling the joy of all the things that you should. I know that a lot of people talk about when they have PMS, liking chocolate. Uh-huh. Well, there is an amino acid in chocolate that plays a role with dopamine. It's it's DL phenylalanine. And does um, that increase dopamine? It does increase dopamine. Dopamine. So it makes you feel a little bit better. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's a very delicate balance with serotonin and dopamine. Huh. So for women, we don't tolerate as low levels of neurotransmitters as men do because at ovulation, dopamine goes up because that's our libido, that's our drive to mate. Our serotonin drops so that person can be irritable, right, mm-hmm. at ovulation. And two to three days before the cycle begins, they both drop. So now no we wonder. are fatigued, maybe a little moody or depressed. We're excellent yeah. to be around. <laughs> and agitated. And, yeah. and so then things normalize, you know, a little bit after. So our women really don't tolerate it as much. So dopamine is important. And, you know, norepinephrine and epinephrine mm-hmm. are important too. Those two neurotransmitters in other countries, they call them adrenaline and noradrenaline. Do which they? Is, yeah, which is something that we kind of know. We just talk about adrenaline junkies. Why do we uh, <clears throat> refer to it differently here in the U.S.? Um, it's just that we feel that it's more precise based on the molecule itself. Okay. But, of course, the Europeans do. It's kind of like, why do we use the measuring system that we do and they use metric? It'll be nice when we're all on one page. Yeah. Noradrenaline or norepinephrine also plays a role in focus and mood. Okay. And it plays a role in sleep, just like serotonin does. Mm-hmm. And you kind of think, well, why does the stimulating neurotransmitter play a role in sleep? Well, you have to have enough and you have to have balance for sleep to happen. I see. So norepinephrine converts into epinephrine mm-hmm. or adrenaline. And that's our get up and go. Or it's our too much get up and go. Yes. A lot of our A type personalities will be elevated in their excretion values of norepinephrine and epinephrine. They'll have worse sleep and uh, more anxiety. Dr. Thomas Boyce, he is a pediatrician and wrote a book about classifying children as a dandelion or an orchid. Right. So the dandelion is one of those children who can recover quickly they can flourish in any kind of environment survivors they're survivors survivors of stress yes it's yeah. of stress and the orchid whew, is very sensitive mm-hmm. i was definitely <laughs> the orchid child right <laughs> me too yes there's gifts to it 
And I really think that people need to understand that there is a difference in their recovery. So if they experience the same Mm -hmm. stimulus, there's just a longer recovery, or at least that's how I experience it. Or I have to compensate with the neurotransmitters to be able to be more in the normal range. You bet. And there's so many studies. There's this one that comes to mind that, that is so profound to me. Women that were raped, they studied them and their response to stress and the way the brain responded. And women that were flashed or had a non-physical abuse and many times the brain responded the same. So the response as far as PTSD could be equivalent, you know, in each person, even though it was not a physical assault. Our feature product for this episode is the My Brain Balance at-home neurotransmitter test. Stress, a poor diet, and genetic factors can cause these chemical messengers to get out of balance. And with the Wellness City program, you'll receive supplemental and dietary solutions to bring your levels back into normal ranges for overall brain health. Go to yourtruthreveal.com slash store and use promo code TRUTH for a 20% discount. Episode 4 is the continuation of this interview with Pam McAmel Helmley. It's really great to just know that you're doing something better for your body and it lets your body adjust. Mm -hmm. You are changing the biochemistry of your body when you start taking action on doing some things healthfully. How does your diet affect your brain health? I invite you to post your answers in the comments below. There are also great resources in the description. Please subscribe and click on the bell so you'll know when the next episode is available. And for more learning, download your free worksheet at yourtruthreveal.com. Thank you for watching. I'm Erica Marcoux.